All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the fifth day of October in the year of our Lord, 2023. And if you watched the previous video, you'll know that something was missing. My glasses. And I've been looking high and low to find them. And it was that sort of a distraction even before I did that video. And, and it's like, this, this day's not going good. Uh, and my, my eye is underneath, I put a little makeup on it, it's vividly purple. I didn't want it to be a distraction, but without the glasses especially, it's evident. <laughs> I don't like the way I look without them. So anyway, the uh, I did find them. I did find them. I gave up. I looked everywhere, everywhere, everywhere. Uh, and then I finally said, Lord, I can't find my glasses. Please help me. And he came through, as always, as always. And my mind went back to, uh, I'd looked everywhere that, that didn't make any sense at all. And I was thinking, uh, I think I had my glasses on uh, when I got the chicken feed yesterday. And when I had the, the, the slap in the face um, by a, a saw stand, uh, throwing the, the sack of, one of the sacks of uh, feed up in the corner. And I... And I'd looked there. I'd looked because I thought it might knock my glasses off. And I was a bit stunned. So, but that came back to my mind after I'd prayed. And I, so I, I'm going to take another look there. And I went there and I pulled the back of bag of feet out and I had a flashlight with me. And there they were folded up on the floor. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All honor and glory be to thee. How many times in my life have I? I've had similar things happen. Uh, just, oh, about two weeks ago, I think, another example of God's grace in the life of one of his believers. Almost every time I have a battery fail, every time, as far back as I can remember now, as far as it's a, a believer, really, that I've had a battery fail, they always fail in the driveway. They fail in the driveway. I go out there, try to start the vehicle, and it doesn't work. I mean, a dead bat not a simply a dead battery, but a defective battery. And that usually happens when the weather starts getting a little cooler, but not always. And I had this happen in my old van, and uh, it was in the driveway. Where you're not out in the middle of nowhere, you're not someplace where you can't do anything, you're not someplace where you don't have any tools. And of course, we have, we have two vehicles, so... It was a matter of the next day using my wife's car, going to, get, going to Walmart, get another one. These seven-year guarantee batteries, they last for four years. I always batteries don't, if, if your battery's over four years old and it, you've got a problem, it's probably the battery. Mm -hmm. Not just not charged, but it's probably a battery that's too old to be reliable. So... That those cause so many problems, and sometimes they can be weird problems. Uh, but yes, thank God that the batteries go dead. They go bad in the driveway. He has angels to watch over us. And, uh, <laughs> you know, even when things happen, uh, I got to look at, I think I'm looking at a mirror. I'm not, I'm looking at the screen. So this is, uh, this, this thing here, it must have slapped my glasses off my head, and I was so stunned that all I was doing, ah, it hurt. But it didn't apparently do any real damage. It just slapped me in the face. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> ah, in case you were wondering how that all turned out. 
All right, so enough enough of me and I, the video that I have not posted yet, but the one I've just done. I almost don't want to post it because, but it's necessary. It's necessary because it, it's, it's, I'm more convinced than ever that theology is a hindrance to understanding God's Word. So often, the human theology, that which is not taught by the Bible, a good teacher of the Scriptures teaches the Scriptures and doesn't try to bring in man's theology. Uh, because it's not right. It's always defective because we're defective. Even the, the best Christians do not understand the depths of the grace and mercy of God. It's How unfathomable are those depths? Yes, and when we make up systems of theology supposedly to help people understand, we're not helping people to understand. We are distorting the Word of God. And that's why I did that video, because of dispensationalism's terrible doctrine of two people of God. They, they simply, and often if you look at the character of the teachers that, that taught some of this stuff, that should be a warning. Uh, just like today, there, is, there are bad teachers out there. They come dressed as sheep, but they're wolves. They're unbelievers under, under the skin. And uh, they have sometimes have nasty personalities, and John Darby was one of those. Brilliant man, but whether he was actually saved or not is an issue that God knows. Uh, but uh, he was not someone you would want as pastor of your church. He was a factious, self-centered man. It was his way or the highway. And he had no, uh, no tolerance for anyone that did not fully accept his opinions. He was just a terrible individual like that. Darby, oh, man. Uh, and his followers caused trouble all over the place. Spurgeon. Uh, remarked about uh, the followers of John Darby. Now, not all the Plymouth Brethren were followers of Darby, uh, but uh, they today have become a very. Uh, there are they've broken up into all kinds of sects, and some of them are just plain old cults now, terribly uh, defective sects, believing they are the only people of God and into following human opinion, just false teachers, just just weird, just got into utter weirdness. Not all, uh, but in many ways, many ways I would agree with them on some things. There, there is no clergy in the Christian church, um, but some of the things they teach are correct. But you have to love the brethren. You cannot be the one true people all to yourself. It's, it's just not true. You, forget, you strain at gnats and swallow camels. Whether you have a single pastor or elders or no clergy at all is not an essential of the faith. These aren't essential. Even, even as I mentioned the other day, probably, probably I'm going to get all kinds of hate comments from this. Who knows? Maybe they'll love me for the wrong reason. The, the fact that women preachers is not the unpardonable sin. It is not apostasy. It is not apostasy. I don't approve, but it's not apostasy. When we understand why Paul was saying that there is no commandment in the Old Testament or commandment in the New, uh, it is we are to avoid giving offense, and having a woman a preacher, preacher is offensive, okay? It is. Offensive to many. So you shouldn't do it. Uh, just like having a man trying to be, a, a, you know, it, it's not abiding in, in uh, the uh, creation order, the order of this fallen creation now. And again, it's just like women covering their heads. Uh, in some places, it's it's not an issue. If you're living in an Islamic country, it is an issue. And it was contrary to the practice. There is no commandments in the law about this. But going contra contrary to uh, 
to established norms offends people unnecessarily. And Christians should not give offense lest we hinder the proclamation of the gospel, lest people reject the gospel, not because they reject the gospel, but because they reject our behavior. Christ is wounded in the house of his friends. Again. And as far as most of the world goes, fundamentalist Baptists are reproach. Because of our love? Because we preach the gospel? No, because of our scandalous behavior. Scandalous in multiple ways. including sexual immorality, which is strange, but yeah, it happens, and the covering up of these things. And when the world sees something, and uh, Jack Hiles' church, he's gone now, uh, but his sons and others there, that, that church is notorious. And this always gets paraded out in the world. Because that's where Satan wants it. Satan causes it. He works to, to bring these things to pass. And then he uses it as, See? All these Christians are frauds. And so is their gospel. That's how he works. He's a liar. But good liars always use facts to bolster their lies. Look at those people. He does see he wants you to look at them rather than to look to Christ. God forgive us for you know and covering up some of this stuff. And this is an issue with the local independent fundamental Baptist church, which I don't even know what it means anymore because they come in all flavors. This one looks a whole lot more like a Rick Warren church in many ways. The fancy coffee and pastry and the when you come in the door. I mean, fancy. Fancy smancy. And so many churches in this area are doing this kind of stuff. If you think coffee and pastry will bring people to Christ, you are ignorant of the power of the gospel. You are ignorant of what the scripture teaches. We are not supposed to use those kind of methods. If we draw people to church based on the flesh, then we'll have a church filled with people that love the flesh. We must depend on God to draw his people. The Spirit of God must do it. We can't save anyone. Only God can save. And it's, it's a shame that we have to waste time on things like that. But that's why I was, went into the, the dispensationalism uh, and the, the fact that not, it's not the replacement theology of the Reformed Covenantal Calvinists. And it is not the dispensationalism bifurcated salvation of uh, many of the dispensationalists, where you got Israel and the church being two separate entities. The replacement uh, uh, theology says that Israel has been replaced by the church. That's not true. That's unbiblical. And the other says there are two separate entities and there'll always be two separate entities. That is not true either. The church was unknown until Pentecost. That's not true. God's people were not unknown. What it is, is God's people under the Old Covenant and then God's people under the New Covenant. And the Old Covenant was a preparatory uh, background for the New Covenant, which we will look at. And those under the Old Covenant were not complete until Christ died on the cross. That strange passage in the New Testament about many of the Old Testament saints rising, Yes. Why does Jesus talk about Abraham being 
in paradise rather than in heaven? There's a reason. They could not go into the presence of God until the atonement had been complete. Christ had to atone for the sins of the world. All right, so the, that, uh, yeah, God has to actually do things like that. And theologians are often ignorant of the scriptures. They're more focused on theology and their own thoughts than on the scriptures. You don't find theology, uh, you don't find light in the, in the minds of men. Like the, 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 the so-called enlightenment was not enlightenment at all because it was not focused on Christ. It was a return to pre-Christian times on belief. On belief. So today I want to get into the, the actual new covenant. And this is so important and most Christians are completely ignorant of it. Although you will hear it mentioned in Reformed churches, you'll almost, I've never heard this mentioned by dispensationalists because they do not think it is relevant to the church. They do not understand the scriptures. It is a system of Bible mutilation. There are distinctives. There's something now uh, called, and I haven't looked at it in detail, New Covenant Theology, which is better than the two, than either the Reformed view or Reformed Covenant Theology, which is not biblical covenants, or uh, dispensationalism. But dispensationalism tends to be moving in that direction, too. Uh, this, there's a complete distinction between the Old Covenant and the New they are different kinds of covenant, as the Bible plainly tells us. And dispensationalists don't care about covenants. <laughs> They're about dispensations. Now, a dispensation is very roughly similar to the idea of covenant, but no, a covenant is, is the promises of God. Uh, the old covenant of the law were, was first Abraham actually the covenant that was given to Abraham was really part of the new covenant the promises of the new covenant were given to Abraham the promises of the new covenant were revealed in the in the law and the prophets but they didn't come into force until Christ had made atonement for the sins of the world Last Supper, we'll see that. Jesus says, this is the new covenant in my blood. The cup of redemption, I believe. It probably was in the Passover. The, there's, if I remember right, seven cups of wine. Wine. Alcoholic wine. Uh, that would be a little too much, I would say. But I think if I, if I had drank seven even small cups of wine, I'd be a little bit tipsy. Uh, I wouldn't want to drink that much wine. I, I don't know an actual thing. Maybe it was... How, I don't know how they do it exactly. Of course, to, to the, the Jewish practice today might not be identical. I don't think some of the things that they do today were part of the, of the revealed scripture at all. But uh, anyway... Uh, yes, uh, the Jesus was talking about they were celebrating the Passover meal, the Last Supper. And when that's forgotten, you know, when Jesus takes the bread and says, this is my body, and he takes the wine and says, this is my blood, it's the Passover. And he is the true Passover. And to do what, like, Roman Catholicism does, and to a lesser degree, Lutheranism does, and Anglicanism does, takes it the bread and the wine as being the thing itself rather than than signs of the reality that is Christ Yeesh. miss it they miss it and I was talking to a Lutheran minister about these very issues and he recognized exactly what I was saying 
And, and I could see on his face, you know, he's like, well, yeah, that's true, but we also believe this other nonsense. He didn't say nonsense, but, you know, he was he was struggling a little bit to, to defend it because you present people with clear teaching from the Scripture. If they're Bible-believing, and he's a Bible-believing Lutheran, it makes him a little uncomfortable because some of their doctrine just doesn't fit in the scripture well because it's it's a hangover from Romanism. A hangover. Quite that's a good way to put it, too. Uh, the, the day you wake up after you've drank way too much, and I remember those days. It's like, wow, that wasn't worth it. <laughs> that I think that's God telling you excessive alcohol is not my will. Uh, young and stupid. Young and foolish. Yeah. But, uh... The answer is not prohibition. History tells us that. No, it's not. It is... Well, it's like Paul said, I, I'm convinced that in, uh, in of itself, all things are good. All things are to be received if, if you give thanks for them. Just including including alcohol. It's a good thing. In the Old Testament, it's a good thing when it's properly used, when it's not misused. As all of God's creation, sin is always the misuse of what God has given us. Is it not? The perversion of what God has given us. And when you saw, tried to solve the problem by eliminating the gift of God, like sexuality, the monks, or some people, some Christians going so crazy that they even castrated themselves. That's not the answer. <laughs> the answer to, to sexual trans, uh, those kind of things, is first of all, you're supposed to have a wife or a husband. Use it properly according to God's ordained role. Abstinence is not the solution. Proper use is the solution. Abstinence just creates other issues. Proper use of the gifts of God. And people that, that, that try to create their own systems of belief, you know, like Augustine, thing, with, with his monkery, he's the one that, that basically created monastic orders, you know, uh, or was one of the, the Augustinian order. There, there were others before that, but, but th that is not the solution. Man's opinions, man's ideas are never the solution. God always has the solution right there in front of you, just like finding my glasses. God knew it. I knew it. Lord, you know where they are. I, I can't find them. Where are they? And he, he always comes through. Now, I didn't, he didn't send an angel who handed them to me, but God led me to it. I don't know exactly what happened behind the scenes, but... And I had already looked there, all right? Okay, now on to the New Covenant, the actual New Covenant. First of all, in this video, I want to show you the New Covenant in the Old, in the Prophets, the promises of a New Covenant. Now, this is explicitly referred to in Hebrews, especially the one that mentions it by name. It's actually revealed uh, quite thoroughly in another section, but it's not called the new covenant there but these are promises of god and again the problem with dispensationalism is it usually treats this and i've talked to to people in particular in my local neighborhood that are very much dispensationalists and i've asked them about this i said is the new covenant relevant to the church and the answer is not really or not directly and I'm like really and this is something that God taught me. It wasn't something I learned from man's theology. I would never have found this in man's theology. 
but it is an, it is an essential doctrine because it's why did Jesus die on the cross? So let's go over to Matthew 26, the Lord's Supper. Of course, uh, Paul uh, gives us the same thing, really. But let's go over to here. Matthew 26, verse 26. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed and broke it. This is the Passover meal. They're celebrating the Passover. Took the bread of the unleavened bread of the Passover. And broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. Again, the context. He's taking the bread of the Passover, the Passover lamb. The blood that was put on the doorposts and the lintel. You have to know the Bible to understand these things. Or somebody has to explain it to you. That if you don't know the Bible. So the, the symbolism here is the, the, the Passover that was to be repeated. But this is a type of Christ. The lamb that takes away the sin of the world. The lamb that that causes the judgment of God to pass over your house. So he's taking the bread of the Passover meal, the unleavened, the bread of haste, unleavened because they were supposed, they had to cook it quickly because they were leaving. They had to be ready to leave. No time to to mess around with raise, get the, letting the dough rise and all that stuff. It was called the bread of haste. When Christ returns, we're not going to have time to mess around with, with making dough. Be ready. They had to leave in a hurry. The, the exodus of Egypt is a type of Christ and the, and the church. Leaving Egypt, leaving the world, entering into the kingdom of God. That's what they were doing. They were leaving the world, Egypt, the paganism and everything else. God was delivering that from them to become his people. His unique people. The church is his unique people today. We are Israel. We are believing Israel. We have been grafted in to the olive tree that is Israel. As I explained in the last video. Or actually as Paul explains in the last video. We're not a replacement for Israel. We are Israel. We are simply Gentiles by birth. I'm talking about not the, not the Jewish believers, but the, the uh, most Christians are not of Jewish origin. Gentiles who have been grafted, who have been cut off from a wild olive tree and grafted into the olive tree of God's people. God has one people called Israel, the Israel of God. The believers, those who trust in him. People that did not trust in him in the Old Testament were not part of his people because his people have always been those who trust him. It's not by race, never was by race. It's always been by faith in God. You really want to argue with that. If, if, you have, if you try to argue with that, I'm thinking there's something wrong with what you believe. There's something wrong with the theology of man you have believed. The church isn't, God doesn't have a new people in the church. It's just the church has come into a new covenant that is so fantastically better than the covenant of Moses that actually deals with the problem of sin, really. It delivers from sin, rather than simply condemning you, which is what the law of Moses does. That's not a solution to the problem. That's not a solution to the fall. The new covenant is God's solution to the fall. As they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take, eat, this is my body. What is he doing? He's saying, I am the Passover. I am the true Passover. 
I am what the Passover is a symbol of, a shadow of, a type of. I am the Savior of Israel, the Messiah. I am God in flesh, and I'm about to deliver you from the curse. That very day, this is the evening, which is the beginning of the day Jesus was crucified on. Jewish time reckoning. The day starts at sundown and goes to sundown in that world. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. Okay. New covenant. Notice in this text, they don't ask him, what do you mean new covenant? Why? Because they were Jews. They knew the prophets. They knew the promises that God had made of a new covenant. They didn't have to ask what Jesus meant. That's why he died on the cross. The blood of the new covenant. The old covenant came into force by blood. The blood of the Lamb. Here you have the blood of the Lamb of God. The true Lamb of God. The Messiah, the Savior. Giving his life as an atonement for sins. He was going to do that that very day. This is Jewish calendar. You're talking about this is the beginning of the day. That morning, they would crucify him. Okay, so let's go to the promise of this in the Old Testament. Now, it occurs in many places but uh, it's explicit in Jeremiah. Now, God talks about a new covenant in many places, but in Jeremiah 31, he spells it out in some detail. What is he talking about? And in Hebrews, and I encourage you to look at Hebrews. I'll probably do a video on that after I do this, uh, the Old Testament promises, where the author of Hebrews goes into that and explains this is a far better, it's a different kind of covenant altogether. It's not like the covenant of the law at all. It's a different kind of covenant. Not just uh, a, a, a new as in a, a, a better, but it is a completely different covenant of its very nature. And I'm going to give you a little hint of what that is. In the Old Covenant, it depends on your obedience to law. The new covenant, what you do, God makes promises if you keep the covenant, if you do certain things, if you obey the commandments of the covenant, if you stay in the covenant, if you circumcise your children, if you do these things, if you if you seek to, it wasn't dependent completely on obedience, but, but you do what you, you seek to obey the, the covenant. The new covenant is completely different. It has nothing to do with what you do. It promises completely about what God promises to do. And you'll see this. There is nothing, there's no conditionality as far as under that this covenant what you must do to, to get the benefits of this covenant. You don't have to do any work for this covenant. You don't have to obey any laws for this covenant. It is simply what God promises to do in you. It's his work, not your work. That's what makes it a different kind of covenant. One of the things that makes it different. Completely different. By grace you are saved through faith, and that not of yourself. You're, it's a gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. Completely different than the old covenant. So Jeremiah 31, 31 says this, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, future time now, up to a future time, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, with his people. 
which were split here. Okay, now this is this is why dispensationalists completely miss the whole thing because they think that this is promises to Israel and has nothing to do with the church. Foolish people. They don't read the Bible. They they listen to their theology. They listen to Schofield and Darby rather than to God. Once you've bought into the system, you're blinded. Just like once you buy into Calvinism, you're blinded by it. Blinded to the part of the, of the Word of God that does not agree with their system. You'll be unable to see it. You've got filters on your eyes. I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day which I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So this is about the Exodus, the Passover, taking them out of Egypt. With us, God has taken us out of the world. This is, see how closely they're related. Delivered them from the world, from bondage, into the kingdom of God. His, to become his particular, peculiar people. Peculiar as in different than everyone else. Where is that truly fulfilled? Not under the law of Moses, but under the new covenant, which is the all who are the Israel of God are in the new covenant, as they were in the old covenant, in the covenant. This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. In other words, it won't be external obedience to a law written on stone. It's something that God will write on our hearts. So we desire. See, the old covenant didn't change your heart. It was an external standard you had to conform to. It's not simply what you wanted to do, your desires. So God will make his will the desire of your heart. I will give them the desires of their heart. That doesn't mean what they want. It means I will put my desires in you. Makes it easier that way. <laughs> That's a truly children of God. And I will be their God, and they will be my people. Peter talks of this. A peculiar people. The people of God. A royal priesthood. A holy nation. What do you think he's talking about? He's talking about, he's referring to these, to all kinds of promises in the Old Testament. The fulfillment of that in his new people, new in the sense of under a new covenant. No more shall, shall man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. New covenant. Born again. God is in you. You know him. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Only under the new covenant is that true. Only after Christ is that true. The laws, the sacrifices in the old covenant never took away sin. And they certainly never took away deliberate sin. It was only sins committed in ignorance. In other words, you didn't know what the law said and you broke it. They did not cover willful sin. The new covenant does. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for light by day, uh, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is his name. For if those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel will cease from being a nation before me forever. 
Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth search out, searched out, so also shall all the seed of Israel for all they have done, says the Lord. I will cast off all the seed of Israel for all they have done, says the Lord. If the heavens can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out. Because God says this is an eternal covenant. He won't cast off Israel completely. This is the new covenant. This is, these were not under the law. Under the law, he says he will cast them out. They don't keep the covenant. He's, they're cast out. See, the church is a continuation of Israel, not a replacement. And it's not separate from Israel. It's not a, a new separate thing. It is different than Old Testament Israel because it's a new covenant. But Old Testament Israel, true the true Israel of God in the Old Testament, were those who believed in Yahweh, who trusted in God. Same in the New Testament. Believers, not unbelievers. Except the circumcision now is the circumcision of your heart not of your outward flesh. We have a far better covenant. All right, so let's go to Ezekiel 36, starting at verse 23. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations. Profaned by who? Partially by Israel by their behavior, which you profaned in their midst, Israel profaned in the midst, profaned the name of God. And the nation shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in you before their eyes. For I will take you from among the nations. What did Jesus, what's the Great Commission? Go into all the world. Make disciples out of all nations. Take people out of all nations. Make them my disciples. I will take you from among the nations and gather you out of all countries. This is not the Jews. Not just the Jews. But people from all nations. And will bring you into your own land. What's our own land? The kingdom of God. This is what this is really talking about. I will sprinkle clean water on you. Uh, talking about the old covenant. The, the sprinkling to make things holy. Not talking about water baptism sprinkling here. And you shall be clean. See, this is God's, of course, he's speaking to a people that, that are not spiritual people. And you shall be clean. Who, who's doing the work here? Just like in Jeremiah 31. Who is doing the work? I will take you out from the nations and gather you and bring you into your own land. And I will sprinkle clean water on you. And you shall be clean. Real cleansing. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Who? Who will do it? God does it. Did he do this in the Old Testament? No, he did not. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. Where does that happen? In the new covenant. The new birth. That's what Jesus is talking about in John chapter 3. You must be born again. You must be born of the spirit. Or you must be born from above. Which is the actual little, little, uh, literal rendering of that. From above. You must be born of God. Begotten by God. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. And I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will take the old, the heart of stone out of your flesh. The hard, self-centered heart. It's like stone, dead to God. And give you a heart of flesh. Soft, warm, alive. 
not talking about flesh in the bad way, but, but a heart of a living heart that's soft toward God instead of hard, soft toward others, not self-centered anymore, a new heart. And I will put my spirit in you. See, this is, this is, this is the proof right here that this is the new covenant. This is what came at Pentecost, the pouring out of the Holy Spirit, not just upon us or among us, but in us. And every believer, every born-again Christian, has the Holy Spirit dwelling in you. I will put my spirit within you, my spirit. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you will dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. Now the scripture tells us that Abraham sought for a city whose builder was God. Not referring to a simple area of land in the Middle East. A city whose builder is God. Who is the builder of the kingdom of God? Who is the builder, the architect of the church? See, in the New Testament, Stephen, in his trial, refers to the church in the wilderness. See, again, it's a continuation of the people of God, first under an old covenant, and then under Christ, under the new covenant. It's not a replacement. It's not a separate entity. The Reformed covenantal theology is wrong, and dispensationalism is wrong. These are major issues, too. This is not a minor thing. This affects how we understand the church, how we understand Israel, how we understand God's promises, how we understand Scripture. The land that I gave to your fathers, the promises to Abraham, for a real land. Like I said, the scripture says he was seeking a, a city built by God. Not an earthly paradise. A city built by God that has foundations. You shall be my people and I will be your God. That is fulfilled today among us. And it will be fulfilled to a far greater extent in the kingdom of God in the future, both in the, uh, in the uh, millennium and then in the final state where God himself comes down and dwells among the Father himself comes down and dwells among the midst of his people in a new earth and a new heaven. And it shall, so it shall be forever. Oh, I should... I don't know if I should actually say final state or not. No, well, yes, but during that time, during that ongoing time, it's not timeless. Not timeless. God, the scripture says God has uh, that that we cannot even contemplate, even imagine the things that God has prepared for us in the ages plural to come. Ages. I will deliver you from all your uncleanness. Who is, who, who is the one who sanctifies the church? The Israel of God. God. This is all God working. See, the new covenant is all about what God does. The cross is all about what God does. Not about us doing, it's about his doing. I will call for the grain and multiply it and bring no famine on, on you. Remember Jesus teaching to his disciples. Do not worry about what you're going to eat, and what you're going to wear. These are the things that Gentiles worry about. God knows what you need. He'll take care of you. See, under the Old Testament, famine and stuff were, were curses for disobedience. God says, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm taking full responsibility for it all. Including making you what you're supposed to be. And I'll take care of you. 
I will bring no famine on you. Even in the Old Testament, David said, I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor their children begging bread on the, in the streets. Neither have I. I've spent a lot of time working with the homeless. I've never seen the righteous forsaken or their children children begging bread on, bread on the streets. You don't find God's people among them. Unless they're among them to proclaim the gospel to. And going out into the world trying to fix the world and solve the problems of homelessness is a fool's errand. You need to proclaim the gospel to these people God will save them, and then God will take care of them. What they need is someone who is able and willing to transform them from the inside out. Everything else is a waste of time. You will not change them or their circumstances. And that is true about everyone. I will multiply the fruit of your trees and in the increase of your fields. Take this a little spiritually. Take it physically, but also take it spiritually. Our garden, my garden is always super abundant, and I've just expanded it. I don't know why. I always have way more than we can possibly eat. Or my family needs way more. It's like, oh, no, not another two pails of cucumbers. Oh, no, not all those. Oh, I got so much to can. <laughs> what are we going to do with it? more than I can possibly do? Why would I do it? It would it'd just go to waste. More than I can give away. See, this is both spiritual and literal. This is God blesses literally to his people. Bring no, and you'll never again bear the reproach of famine among my nation, the nations. So in Israel in the Old Testament, God's judgment, they became a reproach to the nations. They, look at their own God is judging them. God blesses his people under the new covenant. He promises to. These are promises of God, brothers and sisters. If you don't know the promises of God, you can't walk in faith of those promises. You don't know what's been promised to you. And you'll fall victim to charlatans. Like Joel Osteen. Who don't know the promises of God either. Then you will remember your evil ways and your deeds that were not good. And will loathe yourself in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. Do we not do this too? We look back at our lives and we loathe ourselves. Oh, God, what a wretch I am. What a failure I am. Is this not true? For believers today, those who are born again, those who are in the new covenant. Not for your sake do I do this, says the Lord. Not because you're such a great nation, Israel. Let it be known to you. Be ashamed and confounded for your own ways, O house of Israel. The Holy Spirit convicts you of your sins. O wretched man that I am. Is that not true? Thus says the Lord God, on the day that I cleanse you from all your iniquities, I will also enable you to dwell in the cities, and the ruins shall be rebuilt. The desolate land shall be tilled instead of being lying desolate in the sight of all who pass by. Again, there's there's a, a, a literal thing that will come to pay, pass when Christ returns, too, uh, and gathers uh, many more of the physical descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to himself. When they see him, they will weep and mourn as for a long lost son when he returns visibly with us. And they, and they will know, oh, those darn Gentiles were right all the time. Yeah, they'll, 
Oh, yeah. God deliver them, Israel. I've, I've been there. I've walked the streets. Spiritual death. Israel, unbelieving Israel, is spiritually dead. They do not know God. They are as dead as any people on earth. Twice so, because they have God's revelation. And they reject it, distort it, twist it. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Anyway, those, those are where the, uh, the promises of the New Covenant are most clearly and extensively given in the Old. Jeremiah chapter 31, starting at verse 31, and Ezekiel 36, starting at verse, about verse 26. Uh, and again, another problem with dispensationalism is it insists on taking spiritual things and making them literal. Literal in the fact as physical things. And God's promise is when God speaks spiritually, he uses natural things to illustrate it. That doesn't mean the natural is untrue, but that's not the point. Like parables. The parables, if you take them in a stone literal sense, they don't make any sense at all. Jesus is speaking spiritual. Spiritually. The scripture says spiritual things must be spiritually understood. And dispensationalism tends to not do that. Whereas Reformed theology tends to spiritualize everything. Man's theology is bad. It will blind you to the truth. And this is essential truth. Knowing what God has promised to, to do through Christ, what he promises he will do in those who trust him. Not that these things aren't all revealed in the New Testament, too. But just twisting God's revelation as these systems of theology and interpretation do, do not help you to understand the truth of God and his promises, the promises of the gospel, the promises of salvation, the salvation that is in Christ. For today, not just for some time, in the great by and by, no, today, God promises to do these things among his people. It'll change your life. Once you know that God has promised to change your heart, it's not something you do, not something you can do, it's something God promises to do. Then you live by faith in his promises. God, change my heart. Deliver me from this. Make me what you have want me to be as you have promised to do so. For you will not break your promises. So you can go to God in faith and boldly become, come before the throne of grace, grasping on these promises and saying, God, you promised to do it. I want to see it in me. You understand how important that is. Boldly. Not humbly, oh God, if it is, I, this is the will of God. And if you say, oh, if you're, if you're willing, God says he's willing. You're not believing him. You've got to come in faith in the sure and certain revealed promises of God under the new covenant. Do you understand? It will change your life. You won't have a wimpy Christian life struggling with sin and all this stuff, trying to make yourself acceptable to God. You'll know it's his responsibility. Grab hold of God and say, I will not let you go 
until you do what you promised. It will change your life. It will change your life. It will change your relationship with God. It is so important. God is, doesn't want us to be half-hearted when it comes to his promises. He doesn't want to, us to be fearful. He wants us to exercise that kind of faith where we can go boldly before his throne, not with disrespect, but say, Lord, you promised. I don't see it yet. You promised. I know you're going to do it. I'm waiting. I'm waiting. I want to see it. I want to see it in my life. He'll do it. He'll do it. He wants to see that faith. He wants you to be bold in what he has promised that are clearly God's will, not carnal desires, but clearly God's will as revealed in the Old Testament and the New. More clearly in the New. Okay? We will continue on. We'll go on next to the book of Hebrews and see what the New Testament says about the new covenant and how it is a much better covenant. It should be obvious to everyone by now. <laughs>